Hey, Off-White Coat listeners, it is my privilege to get to tell you about this sweet deal from our friends over at Pygmonic. If you haven't heard about Pygmonic, it is a fantastic picture-based mnemonic platform that can certainly help out any student. Most of the videos are around two minutes long and provide a quick and effective way to memorize material for any upcoming medical exam. It is extremely efficient. They have this search bar function where you can search playlists on general topics like renal to step one to step two, or even first aid and other books. If you want to review the Pygmonic for later, you can even make a playlist of your own. Pygmonic even has this repetition algorithm that is spaced out according to your learning needs. This helps with increasing long-term retention and allows you to review the right information at the right time. One of my favorite functions is the quizzes that are associated with each Pygmonic. I'll take the quiz first and then learn about the associated pictures and what facts I need to sharpen up on. Honestly, Pygmonic is a fantastic tool, and if you use our code off white coat, you'll get 20% off. That's off white coat with no spaces. So what are you waiting for? Make studying the easiest part of your day. Sign up with Pygmonic and use off white coat to save yourself some money. Welcome everybody to the Off White Coat Podcast. I'm your host Jordan Abney, and I'm joined today by Luis Gonzalez, one of my best friends from medical school. We have been through medical school, and now this man has freshly matched into an IM residency. If you haven't heard, he actually was in one of the previous episodes. So if you love this one, go back, check him out again. <laughs> well, he's I a, guess he's an up and coming star, and he is a returning star at this bad boy. So. I just feel like when you say I'm an up and coming star, I'm like the new fresh face. Like I just got drafted. From like either the NBA or the NFL, like a new wide receiver prod like prospect. Yeah, I mean, honestly, it's more the up and coming bitch boy. <laughs> oh yeah, and the just returning the, star of the podcast. Ah uh, yes, just the scut monkey of the actual hospital. Yes, so <laughs> just how I like to hear it. So fresh off the match, how are you feeling, dude? I'm feeling good. I'm excited that I actually have a job. Yeah, like certain people, like obviously, like a lot of some people in our class, they didn't match. It's hard to even think about because some of these people had like 12 interviews, like they were good students, there were some of our really bright friends and like they didn't get it. So it was almost shocking. Just the fact that I was able to kind of get my job and at my top program makes me kind of set, like excited. But at the same time, I'm also shitting bricks at the idea of even starting yeah, residency. Is. Dude, I was talking to Wally's brother and... I remember asking him questions because I was scared, you know, like I'm going to New York City, which is almost like across the board known for just wrecking its residents. Mm -hmm. And luckily, like one of the reasons I like my program is like they seem to have this uh, very good culture within the residents where everyone kind of helps each other. Mm -hmm. And when I was talking to Wally's brother, he kind of like echoed that. But then Wally texted me and he goes, yeah, bro, like my brother said that you're kind of like shitting bricks to start met like residency. I'm like, hell yeah, dude. Working 80 hours a week, and now, instead of just being like, all right, deuces at 11, now I actually am responsible for these people? Yeah, it's scary as shit. Oh, I can only imagine, like, just how nervous it is, especially starting everything off. Oh, yeah. But, I mean, especially for you, man, you went from working 10 hours a week to 80 hours. I'm just kidding. Oh, my God, dude. (laughs) I can't even imagine. That's an 80% upgrade. Dude, there is a 100% chance of me crying in a closet at some point, but... (laughs) I'm just going to have to get through it, hopefully. The show Scrubs does it best. When yeah. It, that first ever... I think it's the first episode. The first episode. Second, yes, no, it's the first episode. Where you're just nervous as hell. And just leaning on the nurses. I think that's the best representation out of almost every other... You know, there's all those Grey's Anatomy and everything. I don't know about the nurses. I never really watched... No, no, I'm just saying where you're leaning on other people. Oh, yeah. 100%. Know. Like, you don't know shit. So I think there's a part where he an emergency calls and he tries to like run the other way or something like that. Yeah, dude, like a code happens and you have to go to it. Like to be honest, like can you imagine? Like I literally just learned ALS, like ACLS last week, and now they're like, all right, now you really have to do it. Good luck. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Like obviously the training kicks in, and I feel like if you do ACLS, you're definitely trained to do it, but. In the back of my mind, you're always like, yeah, I know this is going to happen, but the first time it does, it's just going to be so shocking. Like, it's going to be your first time. Like, the first time you do, like, just compressions, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I remember the first time I did compressions, I was terrified. Nervous. I was nervous as shit. 
like now I can only imagine when, you know, you're running like a more like effective code when you're actually in a code situation, you're really trying to figure out what the hell to do, you know? Yeah. Luckily it's pretty much an algorithm. Like I haven't even done my, my ACLS yet. I'm doing it towards the middle of June, I think, Mm. but I don't know. I'm excited, but also terrified. (laughs) Every time you do something for the first time, you get nervous and there's a weird thing where you're pulling from like things that you've learned. Your hands aren't like deft in like exactly knowing what to do. Like I remember when I, for my first time giving compressions, you, you're feeling like you're not doing it right, but you're, you're, I remember I was just leaning on the fact that it's like the BG song. Yeah. The BG that, yeah. I was just like, I think I'm going right rhythm. And then, you know, they, but you, you just don't feel, you're like, dear God, please come back, come yeah. back, come back, come, you know. You're not feeling like Please you're going you deep this. enough. Yes. You feel Please. like you're not going deep enough, and you're just like, I don't even think I'm doing much here. Yeah, but, and then, you know, but after you get that practice, so it's really, that's all I was trying to say is that repetition, even on your part, like the more you see, and that's the good thing about being up in New York, you're going to get to see a lot, is you you will start to calm down. You won't have to pull from, like, brain knowledge, but you'll have, like, that... The experience. The experience to know exactly what to do when people are sick, and that's going to be, that's going to be super helpful. In the yeah. long run. No, because it's really good because I was talking to Wally's brother and one of the things that he says is like, look, you're going to have like didactics. Like you have to, right? Like every yeah. every ACGME or whatever needs you to have some sort of didactics, morning report, journal club, all that stuff, right? And he says, yeah, like you'll learn from that stuff too. But in reality, your biggest learning is going to be from experience. And the good thing is you're in New York City. You're going to get the best experience, yeah. you know? Like the amount best slash worse. It's like you get the best experience. Yeah, you get the best complex. education, but at the same <laughs> time, your life is just gonna get you know bite the pillow kind of situation. Mm. <laughs> dude, no, it's so bad. Like he was telling me, he's like, yeah, dude, you get worked hard, especially your first year. I feel like first year sucks for just about everybody. Mm-hmm. But in New York, he was telling me like, since you're all floors, the first because I think what was it, it was nine months of floors. That's yeah. how they scheduled my rotation, like my rotations in in residency. That means like it's five plus one, so I have five plus inpatient wards, and then my plus one is a um, is a clinic block where I'm okay. just you know I think it's Monday through Friday, and then we get an academic half day on Friday, which is cool. So like you basically go in Friday morning, you go to like noon, and then the rest of your day is off, and then you have a golden weekend, which is great. You know, and nice. personally, I think like the the program is good because that's the one mm-hmm. thing I do love about New York programs that I've noticed. Obviously, you have the shit ones. That don't have that, like, culture. But at least at Brooklyn Methodist and even my second choice downstate, the culture was there. Where, like, everyone was helping each other out. And that's what I was really looking for. Oh, yeah. And you you have a residency group that is, I mean, you pretty much know half the people already that they're all homies. Yeah. I mean, I mean hell, I'm living. You, the last person, check out the last interview we did with him and uh, Michael Fragner. But he's going to be on there, too. Yeah, he's, he's in the res- same residency program as you. He is in the same residency program as me, and we're looking to live together again. Honestly, this is the longest relationship of my med school and like medicine career is between me and Fragner because I've lived with him at this point for four years. I would think that it would be the longest relationship of your whole entire life. Though. I think so. Yeah, pretty fucking much, <laughs> it's man. Getting there. No, I'm 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 convinced that the medicine gods do not want to tear apart the dynamic duo. <laughs> Maybe there's something there. You never know. We'll have to bring the boys back together for another podcast. <laughs> well, we are. We're, we're bringing the York. boys together to go to Columbia now. So we are. Yeah. Oh shoot. Yeah. Me and Lewis are about to go to Columbia in the next month, so that'll be fine. We'll be bringing in our uh, uh, Espanol version coming. Ah, soon. Yeah. sí. Yeah. El podcast en español. Mucho gusto. <laughs> <laughs> you actually use that pretty well. Good shit. But yeah, we will. Uh, we're going to be going down there for the month. He has. This one month until he's done, and I have a, a gap month, which has just landed perfectly. So we're going to take the week, go see some senoritas, you know. I'm, I'm stupid excited. I remember I said, I, when I came down to Miami, I wanted to leave, and I wanted to be able to like speak Spanish properly. Yeah. At least decently. And then, not properly, but manageably. Yeah. One, because it's on my application that I can do it. So I need to really step in time. Wait, what did you put it on your application? Oh, I was about to say. It's like, you are one ballsy motherfucker. That's because I planned on having it done. No, I'm kidding. I just wanted to be able to speak Spanish well. uh, And because for one, I see a ton of patients that speak Spanish. And I just hate that I can't build that rapport. with. Because, I mean, I don't know. I love Spanish culture anyway. So I I said when I left Miami that I would be able to do it. 
But then my time in Miami got cut short. So I was like, damn, I'm not going to be able to pull it off in another week. No, oh, yeah, no, not a shot, uh, dude. But Columbia, after Columbia. Honestly, you'll get some good pleasure. practice because yeah. that's the one thing that I've learned, like, especially in Spanish speaking countries. If you're in, for example, like Cartagena, mm-hmm. you'll probably get away with not speaking Spanish a lot. But in Medellin, oh, <laughs> you guys are screwed. I speak Spanish all the time. Dude, honestly, I will say this. Even with, like, someone that's bilingual and that speaks Spanish, it's so funny because sometimes I've noticed. In Colombia, I don't think it'll be an issue. But I remember when I was in Spain. When I went to Spain, even speaking Spanish there, a lot of the times, like, the way I speak Spanish is very Cuban Spanish. And their Spanish Mm -hmm. is obviously, you know, the motherland. Where, you know, the language originated. So, like, there's a lot of, like, common phrases that are different. Like, one of the things that I learned... That was really funny was Argentinians and I think uh, Spanish people, some Spanish people do this too, where the word coger, like coge. To run? No, correr is to run. But coge for me means to grab, like cogeme eso, grab me that, right? In Spain, I remember I was at a hostel. What happened was like I was talking to the lady and we were speaking in Spanish, everything's fine. And she asked me to like sign a document. And I go, cogeme un pluma. Or go me una pluma, you know, bring me or grab me a pen or whatever. And she just looks at me and just like squints. And I'm like, what's going on? She goes, you just told me to fuck my pen. <laughs> You're like, um, um, what? <laughs> I'm not sure if that's the exact translation. Yeah, exactly. You know, uh, and even sometimes like, um, depending on the culture, they'll speak it really fast. Like Spanish yeah. people I've noticed, like in Spain, a lot of the times where like, we were like getting into the conversation and you know emotions were starting to come out they would speak so fast it was especially with the accent it kind of throws mm-hmm. me off like i could understand cuban like you know basically going zero to a hundred because i was gonna say everything you're saying is the pot calling the kettle black because now yeah. i and after being in miami hearing other spanish speakers talk about cuban spanish speakers they're like you gotta give up they, <laughs> they oh yeah like a mile a minute Oh, no, man. But that's the thing. Like, I'm so used to that accent. It's like almost like mental subtitles know, yeah. kick in for me. And I can tell exactly what they're saying. But if it is like someone else that has a different accent and they just start to throttle up, I completely lose a good amount of it. Like, I'm just yeah. like, holy shit, I'm going to need you to slow down. <laughs> yeah. And I, I imagine that's probably how it was in Spain. You're just like, the crazy thing about Spanish is that there's different dialects for, I mean, each different country, really. Like, there's different words being said that mean different things. Oh, yeah, dude. It was like so interesting to me. To all know. the time. Like, certain words or certain phrases, you'll even see it. Like, I'm noticing it a lot more, especially with this translating job. Like, when someone... Like, I can almost tell, like, someone is... Cent- like, I've also lived in Miami, and I'm also part Nicaraguan, so I know the Central American kind of, mm-hmm. like, accent. But seeing the differences, and you'll see it now in Colombia, like, how different they speak and the words they speak are different from your regular Cuban here in Miami. Mm. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's almost different. Like what, to me, in my opinion, I think Colombian is the most elegant Spanish. Mostly because the accent. Because the accent to me just you know, like believe me, when people start speaking Spanish, they're gonna really feel it. Colombia is numero uno. <laughs> <laughs> You're definitely coming back with like a Colombia soccer jersey for sure. I can't wait. Yeah, we're gonna go to Colombia. Lewis is gonna be our translator. <laughs> actually, he actually picked up some a job as a translator now in your time being before residency. Yeah, dude. How has that been going? You're he's a he's one of those Spanish translators. You know, when you you go in, you need a you call the language line. Oh like, yeah, oh, yeah, dude. So like, it's been it's been what cool. Is your doctor number. Uh, it's been a little bit. Like, I wish I was smart enough to have done this earlier. Like, there's no way to actually pick up a job before med school, as we know, or while you're in med school, as we know. But uh, yeah, I mean, besides McDonald's, maybe. Not even McDonald's, man. Like you they need don't all for the two weeks. Yeah, you need all the time you can get, especially like your first two years, and, and especially third year too. But once you're in fourth year, I've noticed that, especially after your applications are sent, in my opinion, you're kind of just on on autopilot. Unless you're in like a tough rotation, which in my case, I preferred to be in very chill rotations. Like I would say, other than my Three. sub eye. other than my sub eye, all of my other rotations, I either went two days a week or I was out by noon. Mm-hmm. And went four or three days a week, you know? Yeah. I kind of scheduled it that way because I wanted to, like, enjoy it. I wish I actually knew about this before, which, if any of you are listening that are bilingual and are fluent, you should kind of do it, man. It's, like, such a nice little bit of extra money 
that if I started doing this while I was, you know, just sitting at home being a potato for like most of my rotations and just worked on this rather than just watching Netflix and eating bagels in my fucking in my living room, I would have a hundred percent made pretty much the money I would have needed to move. Mm, what uh so what company do you work for? So I work Is it for like a company that the hospital like contracts. Or? So yeah, so it's basically like a, a a a phone company. So basically, like I only work over the phone, and other companies will dial in and request a Spanish speaker. Now, for me, I took a course. It's like a forty hour course. It was about like seven hundred bucks, and it basically qualifies you to work at these places. Some places want a national certification; others they don't. You can just you know apply, like I did with this one. And with this company, it's been a nice, it's been hit or miss. Sometimes I've just been asked for like to uh, interpret for banks. Like I've been mm. have like a lot of the times I've been so it's doing. it's not even all. Healthcare. It's not even all healthcare. Like some of them are healthcare related. Like a lot of my calls, I would say over the last two days. Now, granted, I just started. Like I just started yesterday. And, you know, a lot of these calls were just like insurance things. Like a Spanish speaker calling into their insurance company and they don't have a dedicated Spanish speaker working mm. for the company, so they dial me in. Okay. And then I just interpret back and forth for Yeah. Them. Man, yeah, that sounds like a, a steal. So so what was the course about? Like did they teach you medical terms? Did they teach you so things that people were normally asked or just how the whole process works? Honestly, dude, it is such a joke when you're already in the When you already know how to speak Spanish? <laughs> no, it's not even no, because here's the thing. Interpreting, I will say this, before I didn't really have like a lot of I would say respect, I think, for like in terms of like especially when I would work in hospitals where they would prefer someone that's been licensed or qualified to interpret because of the fact that, you know, I've been bilingual. I've been doing interpretations and translations all my life for all my family, right? Yeah. And you do it for us. And I do it for y'all. He's got plenty of practice. So I didn't really expect anything for them to teach it to me. Now, the good thing is it does have practice because especially when you're working in like an interpreter like environment, you really do want to be as accurate as possible and try not to summarize too much and just be as straightforward with what they say as possible. But in terms of the class, really it breaks down to just the craft of how to interpret effectively the laws behind it and then the medical terms, which in reality, the first two are maybe 20%, 30% of the actual class, while most of the actual modules are about medical terminology, mm -hmm. which... I was lucky enough to know a lot of these medical terms in Spanish already. And a lot of the courses, a lot of the modules were just basically teaching you, this is the renal system. And I'm just like, I am literally a doctor. I don't need to watch any of this shit. That's like the perfect thing for you to do. Because that's yes. all they really have to teach you is the medical part so that you could understand. You're like, oh, I actually get that. Yeah. I did. So there was a Spanish speaking girl that she actually was in my rotation, my ER rotation. And she was from Puerto Rico or whatever, but she said she learned, it was actually interesting for her because she learned English, or she learned medicine in English at her, at St. Kitts. She went yeah. to school at St. Kitts. Yeah. She said she learned medicine in English. So then when it came to like hospitals down here at, or in things like where everybody speaks Spanish, when they would talk about certain aspects of medicine in Spanish, she had to really like take a second and think about what was going on because... All of her medical terms. All her medical English. training was in English. English, which is like Latin. So you're just learning the English words for some of that stuff. And then yeah. was there some things that you didn't know in Spanish or did you kind of already know that stuff? I know like all the major organs, like the biggest ones were like gallbladder. The gallbladder one was interesting because it's like vesicula bilar. Vesicula what? Bilar. Bilar. Yeah. So, or biliar. Yeah, the biliary. Yeah, the biliary vesicle, technically. Like, in reality, I didn't remember that one before, but, like, the main ones yeah. I obviously knew. And just, like, for an example, like, upper respiratory tract infection, mm -hmm. you know, or urinary tract infection. Like, how do I say that in Spanish? Yeah. And the good thing is they kind of provide you this glossary, which is really helpful because sometimes on calls, like... I can't remember that word particularly. Yeah, no, even still with yeah. dialects and stuff, that's what makes me think. Yeah. So, so like when certain words, like you have to like be very careful because like sometimes they use different words, right? So 
they'll say a word and I also have like Google Translate and some other thing open just in case like I'll say, all right, can you clarify what you mean by that? So I know yeah. what they mean and it gives me time to either search it up or I can search it up on Google Translate and then see if it kind of helps me. Like, okay, this is kind of like points into this direction, what they mean with it. But for the most part, I mean, I've grown up in Miami. Like most people spoke Spanish here. Obviously, I'm very versed in Cuban Spanish because that's what I grew up on. But, my, you know, my mom is Nicaraguan. My dad is Cuban. All my family is practically Nicaraguan, so I know Central American. And all of my friends were Colombian, Argentinian, um, you know, Costa Rican, Mexican, mm-hmm. you know, all over the place. Dominican, Puerto Rican. So I pretty much have, like, a pretty nice range. But obviously, I'm not perfect. Yeah. So but there's, there's something about when you consistently flex that muscle of switching between languages. Like, whatever that part of your brain is where... It allows you to know all the different languages and everything, and you hear something in this, and then you you're like, okay, that's this, and that kind of thinking. I don't I don't know. Like even as I've been just constantly practicing Spanish over the past month, flexing that muscle, like it gets better, it gets better, and it yeah. gets better, and then you you become super quick. So I think honestly, this translator job is going to be a fantastic, just because it's going to allow you to even communicate better with your patients. Oh yeah, because you are just so quick on. You've just been listening to other people talk, you know, in all aspects, not even just medical. You've been listening to bank deals and oh whatever, yeah, whatever so else. one of the things that I really found, I never learned how to say appeal oh. in Spanish. I never knew what it was. So like today I was on a call for like a bank thing and it was so funny because they were just like, oh yeah, we're going to request an appeal. And when she said appeal, I started looking through the Rolodex of my mind and I'm just like, how the fuck? fuck do you say appeal in spanish and i'm just like uh so i wanted to buy time so i was like writing so i usually have like this little dry erase board that kind of like gives me an idea of how they want to structure it so what i would do no no i'll be like you cut out (laughs) yeah yeah. you cut out can you repeat it and then i go you're you got a little uh mint you're rubbing it you're going out are you going in a tunnel yeah so it was really good because at that point i found out it's like appellation Mm. So that's now I know that word because if now I'm dealing with like an insurance thing, you're going to be doing these, you know, solicitar una apelación, mm. which is Wait, how you say it That's a, to request an appeal? Request an appeal, yeah. Yeah. Solicitar apelación. Solicitar, what? Apelación. Apelación. Sion. Sion. Yeah. See, I, need, I might need that. If we're going to Colombia, I might need to request an appeal. <laughs> <laughs> I might need to know. Nah, to we're know. fine. A lot of stuff's legal. We're good. Um, so when you do this fan, Spanish translator job, is it just... Is my interpretation is it's like Uber. You just sign on whenever. Go yeah, no. it's, it's then... It literally is just like Uber. I get and I sit down at my desk or at my dining room table because I don't have a desk. I click a button that says I'm on. Within a few minutes, I get a call. Mm. And it's yeah, really yeah. cool. So it is literally like Uber. Just like Uber. The one thing is, uh, since I'm an independent contractor, the rates of calls kind of differ. Like one of my friends, my friend, she's a French interpreter. And she would say, yeah, there will be some times where I get maybe, you know, a call or two an hour. Sometimes I'd even go dry and just get no calls in two hours. Yeah. But for me, over the past two days, I have probably not had a call for longer than five minutes. Oh, so it's not even that. It's yet. like... Like, back and forth, back and forth. And a lot of these calls are usually more than 10 minutes. Mm. And some of them, like I was telling you earlier, like, not even some of them. I'd say this is the rare case. It's super funny because they would call in. I had this one lady that she called in. And she spoke in English. So when I introduced myself to the person that called me, I introduced myself and be like, I'll be the Spanish interpreter. And she was like, okay, yeah, you're good to go. And then I started interpreting in Spanish and saying the same greeting in Spanish. Mm -hmm. To my LEP is what they say. Limited English proficient person. Basically the person that is requesting a Spanish speaker. And we start, I start my introduction and she goes, no, wait, wait, wait. And she starts speaking in English. But since my brain has already turned to Spanish, I thought that this was the person calling. Oh. (laughs) So we were all confused for like a solid two minutes until she figured out and just said, look, I speak English. I just need an interpreter just in case I can't explain myself correctly. Mm, Okay. So, and I'm like, oh, so in Spanish, I started asking her, like, would you prefer that I stay on? 
And she goes, yes, just in case, you know, I can't explain myself well, you're here because I do need to practice my English. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay, that's fine. And I tell her what the other person, what the LEP was saying. And she was like, okay, yeah, that's fine. So I basically sat there for 16 minutes just doing nothing. So I was getting paid to just sit there. I mean, that's a win. That's a win. So I I did want to ask you about one thing. So one of my issues is that I'm about to start going through the application process. And I was curious to you, what do you think about, because you matched your number one. Yeah. What do you think was the strongest part of your application? Do you think it was, you know, like your personal statement or your stuff scores or like your composite photo? I mean, <laughs> quite frankly, he has a good one. Uh, he has a good one. He I mean, spared no I, I do look hot in that photo, but at the same time, I would. Ooh, I, I'm hoping more. that they they looked at me for my personality and what I can bring to the table, and not just my looks. You know, I want that for once because clearly wanted, I'm just so attractive. He wanted to make sure that they knew that he looked good too. Exactly. You know, I, I want you to know what you're buying here. Yeah, but and which they like that too because then when they post the residency photo of everybody in their first year, that's what photo they put. Oh yeah, hundred percent. I mean, so they, if that photo is not good. You know, it makes it easier on the buy. Yeah, exactly. So, I don't know. For me, when it comes to... I feel like every program is different. It's hard to say what was my strongest point. I know something... I can only tell you what they brought up the most. Yeah. Mostly what they would always ask me about in my interviews was always my travel experience. Because I always... I put that on my on my actual CV. Mm. Was my travel experience and my teaching experience. He as a high a school and middle... Experience. Yeah. And as a high school and middle school teacher... They always asked about that. Okay. Maybe not the traveling so much, but definitely the teacher. Like I would mm. say if I had I had like eight like sixteen interviews, I would say, that I actually went to. And I think out of those sixteen, I'd say maybe twelve asked about traveling, but every single one asked about my asked teaching. About your teaching. And then they also asked about my research project, which is a quote unquote research project, but it wasn't necessarily. It was more of just like what I would like to compare it to would be like a literature review or like a poster that I did with an actual residency program that is in-house. But it carried a lot of weight because it was just like a unique idea that this one residency was doing at Downstate that most people don't do. And they were just curious about it, so they always asked about what it. What did they do? What, what was the, so what it was? So what it was is like this comprehensive review of a certain thing, right? So for an example, I was on the pulmonology chapter. So what they did was they talked about my two topics were pulmonary nodules and pneumonia. Okay. So I went into the etiology of diseases, manifestations in terms of clinical, like radiographic or any radiology that will come back, any labs that might suggest it. Uh, you would also do severity scoring. So for an example, in terms of pneumonia, is this a inpatient pneumonia where we're going to need to admit you? Or is this an outpatient pneumonia where we would need to just, you know, send you home with some pills and you'll be fine? Mm -hmm. uh, my focus was on inpatient. So when they would come in, we would kind of like break down, okay, what could be the cause of this? Is this just a regular community acquired pneumonia? Or is this, per, for an example, a nosocomial? Is it, do I have to worry about pseudomonas, PCP? You know, yeah. Do I have to you know, worry about MRSA? That was another thing that we always mm. did. And then from there, you kind of go, okay, now I need a specified treatment plan. What is my treatment plan if I do suspect pseudomonas or MRSA or just a regular community acquired? What is my ICU criteria to admit? Yeah. Like so all that type of diagnostic guidelines. Yeah, it's basically just running down the entirety of a one particular condition and running it down from top to bottom, from identification to treatment, and then also like pearls and pitfalls. Yeah, so basically trying to figure out like what kind of suggests a diagnosis and what are some things a lot of people tend to miss. I love that. That literally is what up to date is, and that's what most people use to like that kind of research. Also, is what most people use to get their information when they don't know. Uh, what to do and that's like I'm so interested in like that like how to set up guidelines of like treatment protocols yeah. or even like how they develop surgery techniques like yeah that's one thing I really wish I could figure out a way to do research in like because you know some of them are like BS and yeah I'm like do I really want to waste my time doing reviews for something that doesn't actually like it just seems dumb to talk yeah. about but yeah. If I could figure out how to do one where, you know, you figure out like surgical technique, like how, 
how people design their surgical te- techniques. And, you know, because it takes multiple, multiple yeah, trials, trials and, to make sure that it works. Out, and figuring out what you can do to make a procedure better and then like implementing that, that, oh, that would be so cool. I'd, I'd spend a lot of time on that if I got interested. Yeah. Yeah, man. Heaven help if I get my hands on that. <laughs> yeah. I will be, yeah, lost in the sauce. But yeah, so, okay, so they definitely asked about your research, and then they asked about your teaching. Yeah. Well, they asked about your teaching. Like, how bad did you beat the kids? <laughs> well, I used the switch. Uh, but, no, I'm kidding. Obviously He's not. Like, thank God I taught Florida. Yeah, that, we're lawless here. It's all good. But the funny thing is, they always just ask, like, how it was, because a lot of these residency program directors, they all have, you know, teenage kids for the yeah. most part, or just young children to begin with. And they always ask, like, how how do you even deal with the teenagers or whatever? And I would just share an anecdote or two, and they would eat that shit up. Like, I remember one time I literally – I had my current program, I think, even told me, like, you – we're putting you, you know, obviously, like, we're going to rank you highly, that type of shit. And uh, – like, uh, thank you. And I had, like, a couple Maybe of really stuff. good ones where they were saying, oh, yeah, like, I really enjoyed our conversation. This is probably one of the best conversations we had all day. And it was just me bullshitting and telling stories about me as a teacher, you know? Yeah. Like, it wasn't anything crazy. I think the biggest thing when it comes to interviews in terms of how to get them really is just your scores. Mm-hmm. How like, to get them, but how to how to nail the interview is selling yourself. Oh, yeah, no you got to sell. What it is. You could, you could talk about God knows what. But if you just talk about it in a fun way, they're like, eh, person seems nice. Yeah, it really is just when you get there, you want to be friendly. You want to be able to be Mm -hmm. relatable, big smiles, like just constantly animated, I would say. I wouldn't say act like a cartoon character, but, you know, expressive. I talk a lot with my hands normally because I'm Hispanic, but, you know, and I'm very expressive as it is. But I noticed, like, I got good feedback from that because, you know, these people are doing hundreds of interviews. If you're just a, you know, cardboard cutout that talks back to you, they don't really see it as anything special. And while your interview is only just a part of your full application, whether they want to take you, I would say, I would say it does play a big part. Yeah. Oh, it does. No, yeah. Like, it definitely sets you apart in terms, like, obviously a good amount of it is your scores in general, but... If you get an interview, literally pretend the way I would always do it, which just pretend that that is your only one and kill it. Yeah. Here's the thing. I want to clarify. Your test scores matter because it's more of just like they put it in a range. So you would just, obviously you want to score as much as possible. I feel like we all know that. Score as high as possible. Honestly, get a perfect score if you can on everything. Obviously, it's kind of hard, but it's not necessary. I think He's they have... so easily. Yeah. Get I'm, a perfect score. That's not that yeah, hard. It's not that bad. What I'm saying Some is... Some people won't. I'm Some far won't. from a perfect score, my friend. Some people won't get it, but, you know... Yeah. You could. Yeah. Too but, fun. you know, what I'm saying is they matter, but I would say for most programs, especially since most people apply broad, I wouldn't say that it's going to matter so much in your grand scheme of interviews that you will get. Obviously, try to be smart. Like, for an example, we go from SGU. I didn't apply to, you know, Harvard. That was a waste of 20 bucks. And as a frugal Hispanic guy, that is definitely... Not, I'm not spending an extra $20 on bullshit that I know is going to come back like a no. So oh, you have exactly. to be smart. You got to yeah. be smart. How you many know? places did you apply to? So I applied 100 on okay. the money I am. All I am. Uh, and then I applied 20 more EM because I was on the fence if I wanted to do EM. And it was after applications, after I sent them out and paid for it, that I realized I probably wouldn't going to do EM. Did you rank EM high? I didn't even rank all my EM programs. I had four interview requests from EM. And I only took one because it was downstate and I really liked the program. But in the end, I didn't even end up ranking them because... You had already decided. I've already decided. And to be honest, I wouldn't have thought they would have taken me because of the fact that EM is... Their class sizes are very small. The odds of me getting it would have been very small. Oh. And they, I've, I think I saw one SGU grad at mm. that program, if one. And that's yeah. like a big if. Yeah, so you've got this new residency coming up. Do you have any kind of like prep that you have to do or like a boot camp or anything? Uh, not really. Uh, what I've been kind of told for the most part by most of the residents was we're very well aware that you're basically just going to be a newborn baby calf when you come here and you're not going to know shit. 
Little ba- Bambi knees. Yeah, exactly. Except my mother's going to still be alive at the end of this. And it's funny because they kind of just told me to just do my own thing, right? Mm-hmm. They just said, you know, have fun. Enjoy your, you know, month and a half, two months off. Because once you start, you know, you're in the tunnel now. You're kind of fucked. Yeah. I mean, once you start, I mean, but also I think there's a perfect way to ease an intern into a full-fledged resident. And I think it's a lot of work for the intern, but also you don't need everything at once. You need to, there needs to be an ease in that turns up quick. Yeah. Because your work is way more, you don't need to be coasting around. But I do. I will say, like, if they can find that perfect medium where they like ease you in and then baptize you by fire. Yeah. So the good thing I is, think be fun. from my program in specific, I can only speak about mine, is that they start with two seniors. Like your team are usually two seniors and four interns. So one senior looks after two interns. Yeah. yeah, yeah and one cool. senior will looks at after the other one. And it's good because it it fosters like that di- that like teamwork dynamic, yep. especially when you're coming in and you don't know anything. Because it's not even just the, the the knowing medicine part. A lot of these people haven't well, some of these people haven't worked with the EMR before, mm-hmm. so they don't know how to write orders and all this stuff. Exactly. Like for me, I've used Epic. That's actually one of the reasons why I wanted to go to this program because I know how to use Epic. I know how to write most orders. I not even most. I'm not even gonna kid myself. Like I know how to do. A decent amount of stuff. Like, obviously, I'm going to need, you know, to get hand-holded. And for the most part, all programs know this. That, you know, for the first few months, you're not going to know anything. You're basically just trying to get the bureaucracy. And you are going to type so many orders in, and it's going to come back with an error message. And then you're going to click off, and then you're going to type it in again. And it's going to say error, and then you click to... And to do that to nausea, yeah. and then it's going to work. And, and that is going to work. Like, or your or your senior. senior's gonna walk over there, type it in, it's gonna work immediately, and you're just gonna be like, Okay. Um, also I don't know what I'm gonna diagnose this person with. <laughs> <laughs> like honestly, I'm I'm kinda scared, but I think everything should work out. Oh, it's gonna be fine. I think I think that method is the best way where you have one senior that's kind of looking over the two interns. Yeah, like first off, it allows you to have a better interaction with the people that have been there for a while. So you understand how things work, but also a person that you can bounce off, which you're lucky enough, you know, some of the seniors, you know, you want to have a senior that actually isn't like belittling you or whatever, but yeah, that's like is on a power trip. But besides that, if you can find somebody that's good, that's willing to teach you, like that's where you're going to learn so much. It's like, because all they're doing is looking over what you're doing. But if they say, Hey, I would do this better. That's going to mean so much more than them just letting you swim or whatever, and then you go to the attending and he's like, you really are stupid. Yeah, I don't really think it'll even come to that for the most part because one of the reasons why I chose this was the fact that most of the staff, I would say, is pretty pretty good. They, they do want to teach and they do want to help, so that's what I always wanted. Granted, I know that the work is going to be ridiculous because it is a New York program. Mm-hmm. The way I see it is... I remember coming down here to Cleveland Clinic to do my sub eye and for medicine. And so many of those docs would be from New York grads from the Bronx, from Brooklyn, from Manhattan, whatever the, you know, wherever they decided to do their residency from. And I remember they would take 20 patients and not even blank. So like they've worked with so many complicated patients that like a lot of the times, not to say that there isn't uncomplicated patients here in Florida, obviously there is, but even some of the more complicated ones that I would kind of see in New York, they've already seen. So they've already, by just sheer density and volume, they know how to handle it. And they're almost unfazed. Like, they just see it and they go, all right, I know exactly what to I do. I know what to do. I know how to chart it. I know how to do everything. Not to say that, you know, Florida physicians don't. But in my experience, that's what I saw with New York physicians. Mm-hmm. There, there is a certain amount of education. Now, and I... I think that all styles of learning or training, really training too, you have to, the fire has to be hot, right? You can't forge sharp steel without a hot fire, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah. Like, I, I think it's got to be tough. If it's not tough, you're going to be weak. I think the good thing about, you know, I wish it was some other way around that. I just don't, I don't know personally yeah. any other way to do it. Physics tell us, make the fire hot, makes the, shield, the steel sharp. Yeah. But the, uh, yeah, I think that, there's something about that New York 
feel and that they see so much. They see so much. They've been around people that are brilliant, you know. I don't know. They just, and you get used to the work. Like, I think that transferring over to a, you know, let's say you go to a smaller market or something like that later in your life is going to seem so easy. Yeah. Because you just were in fire. And yeah, now that's like, like, oh, okay. Like, I don't have to be around this anymore. Thank God. Yeah. Like, I don't think I will ever really practice in the city. Like, I love New York City, but I think to live there long term is kind of just like exhausting. Like, I love everything about it, but if I can just be close, like, if I can just be close to it, maybe driving distance or something like that, I would be more keen Better. to Is that where you want to end up? Like, driving No, nah, I don't really know. I'm very open to a lot of things. Like, obviously, I love the North. Like, I love New York City. You know, coming from Miami, I obviously love my culture and having my family here. And obviously, I was a beach kid. I grew up on the beach all the time. So, yeah. it's hard to move, but I... You know, in my mind right now, I love the city so much. I wouldn't mind staying there for these three years. I think it's kind of like too, almost even too soon to say. Like, yeah. I never know. You never know what really happened. You feel? Ooh, he's thinking about converting. I don't know, man. The the, the winters are bad and the beaches are not that great. Just, Jersey think, City is really close to New York. I don't know, man. Like, the, the Jersey beaches, well, I've actually actually been to Jersey Beach, but I've been to Long Island Beach, and uh-huh. that is nothing compared to my nice, tranquil, warm waters of Hollywood Beach and just down here no. at South Point and Key Biscayne. <laughs> I will tell you one thing. They are not. They are not even close, not even. There's a reason people from New York come to Florida. In the south, I like when it's hot, and also they came. They people in New York flooded Miami. I don't know if you noticed. Oh, that. dude, yeah. yeah. I hear it from all the locals because they oh. raised the prices of things and blah blah blah. But it's been flooded, especially since COVID. Are there any limitations to your first year that you're going to have? Besides, you know, you're going to have somebody looking over you. But is there anything that you can or can't do, or are there certain procedures? I know for like some surgery uh, residencies and stuff like that, you don't even get to cut in the first year. But for IM, is there any like limitations? Not that I know of. You're pretty much just thrown. Yeah, you should be just doing the whole... I don't know if I will be or if I won't be. In reality, I'm not Mm. entirely sure. I feel for the most part, the vibe that I've gotten, especially when it comes to like procedures, because IM is not procedure heavy by any means. Yeah. So, you know, you might do a stick... But even for the most part of your nursing staff is really good, which I am really grateful that according to what I've been heard about my program, they're very good. But I still obviously want to practice it, you know, doing a like a sticks and just regular bit of punctures. But I'm also very procedure uh, inclined. One of the the fellowships that I've tossed around in my mind has been Palm Crit. Mm -hmm. That's basically mostly procedure. Almost. Yeah. So obviously I want to get my hands dirty like i want to do it my program doesn't do a lot of icu time the first year then the second year it becomes very very heavy that's perfect so i personally like it that way i think i maybe do two weeks yeah if at most a month in my entire first year and i think it's perfect because it you know gets my hands you know it gets my feet wet Mm -hmm. and makes me think okay do i want to do this but personally i definitely the second i can try to put a central or you know, do a pick line or whatever, I'd be 100% into trying to do it. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly how I am too. Like, I prefer to do the procedures more than yeah, I prefer the thinking stuff. Yeah, I honestly, I'm, I'm kind of like in the middle of both. Like, I definitely enjoy the thinking stuff, but I don't want to just look at a screen my entire yeah. time. Like, I want to do stuff with my hands. That's kind of mm-hmm. how I've always been raised. Like, yeah, like a, I... I prefer to do all the patient interaction like where i'm just like going and figuring things out and doing like everything that is needed for the patient the going back the charting which i'm sure everybody hates but that i'm just like ah you know like i would rather have a person sit behind me and be like oh i think he has this go do this and then and then i'm like okay i figured all this stuff out and you know and then i do another procedure or whatever but I don't know. Yeah, it can be... Um, this is why you're like very surgery or EM inclined yeah. because the notes are literally just little blurbs and just physical he exam and this, goodbye. Yeah, he told me this. I'm checking this. Boom. Let's go. Good luck. And goodbye. then I'm already gone. Like I've already left the building. Yeah. 
And somebody actually had to walk up to the computer and hit the save button because they were like, oh, he, he forgot to He save. forgot to hit save. No, dude, like, honestly, being on surgery rounds is always the best because you'd be like, oh, yeah, we have 20-something patients. And here I'm thinking, oh, we're going to be here for four hours. Yeah. No, we're there for half an hour. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Maybe, four, no, I wouldn't even say half maybe an hour, maybe less good. than an hour, like five minutes a patient. Just go in there. It's like, oh, this is, you know, are you distended? How's your dressing? Okay, are you feeling pain? No, okay, bye. Mm-hmm. It's so great. Honestly, I actually prefer the surgery rounds because I am. It literally takes all day. And yeah. you're going to know that for sure after, by the end of this year. Yeah, dude. But like, it, Here's the thing. I don't mind medicine rounds as much because I like to think through problems. But here's the thing. If it's unnecessary, like, okay, like we don't need a lecture on hyponatremia right now. We can do that later mm-hmm. after we have finished all of our shit. Like, there's no reason why we should sit here and you should tell me about all the causes of hypokalemia and go into deep detail into why it happens when I'm trying to get through another 15 patients. Yes. Let's, you know, let's keep it moving. Okay, he's got hypokalemia. We'll talk about it later. Bye. Mm-hmm. Go. The one actually great thing I did get from my IM sub I is, so I'm very, very procedure oriented. Like, I'm like, okay, when this happens, I do this. And then, and so when I see this person looking like that, I should think this, do this stuff. And go on, you know, like, and maybe it would be more of a bias, but you're just kind of like, you're thinking through the problem, but you haven't, you're going off kind of like feel or, you know, you just, I don't know, you're, you're thinking through the problem, but you haven't like taken the time to think through every freaking concept of it. Well, I had this attending that I worked with all four weeks of my sub I, and God, did he take the time to think through everything. Like it was, we would talk about something and he'd be like, so why did this happen? And then you're like, okay, well, I think because of this. Well, if it's this kind of bacteria that's in, what, why? what, Or what type of bacteria? Why would it be this bacteria? You know, what would you do in this situation? And, what it, and we would go on these tangents, and, it, and then you'd be like, oh, okay, well, that's obviously not the, that's not the answer. What, we, you know, and then we would address another topic. And they'd be like, why would you think it's this? Well, if you think it's this, it would have to have this, 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 this. Okay. Well, you can exclude that and then you move on to the next one. That's good training, though. Dude, I'm telling you, it made me so sharp when it came to being in a room because I started to, at first, it was not how I normally think about things. So it took me a while to like figure out his rhythm because he was he was wanting me to think about every single option and every consideration with every option. But now, I will say that that training helped me because now I go in a room, I go, okay, this person, you know, maybe... Perfect example would be like, they're altered. So now I need to do everything. What am I checking? Why am I checking it? What is, you know, every etiology of every single thing? What are, you know, why am I doing this procedure? And I'm telling you, and it, it's only like his voice in the back of my head, like, why are you doing this? Like a little, and it's so helpful to like, that is a things. very efficient round. Yeah. In my opinion, I prefer my rounds that way because. Why he is teaching, it isn't like it's a lecture. One of the things that I've always, like, with some attendings, I wouldn't say all of them by any means. Like, it almost feels like they're just talking at you. And when you're kind of, like, working in these particular situations where you're not just learning, this isn't just a educational aspect. Like, I do have to, like, implement this immediately. Mm-hmm. I have to make sure that I am taking care of this patient right now. So when you are kind of just talking at me, it doesn't sink in as opposed to, how you're attending was doing is like, why do you think this? Yes. How would you do it? And all of that. Cause now it will stick in my mind better. And now I know if something goes wrong or if I am incorrect about my diagnosis or assessment or whatever, I can move and I know, okay, what's the next thing I'm going to do? Yeah. Uh, it sounds very great and awesome, but during the time nerve wrecking. Oh my God. Cause yeah. you're just like, what question is he going to ask? So I'm prepping, I'm prepping. And then halfway through me thinking that he's going to ask a question on the end of this sentence, he goes, wait, why? And I'm like, oh, no. I don't even know why. I lost. Uh, yeah, you lost me completely. Uh, wait, I was supposed to think about that? I didn't even, you know. He, he just, uh, yeah. It, it was nerve-wracking, but it was so beneficial. But, yeah, buddy, it's been so great having you. Thank you again for coming on. Of course, dude. If you have any questions for Lewis, because obviously I'll be with him for a while, you, you can message us at offwhitecoatpodcast at gmail.com. Or you can hit us up on our Instagram. And yeah, Lewis, it's been great. Thank you. Of course, dude.
Lewis MD, baby. That's He's me. He's now here. Lewis Gonzalez MD, baby. Hey, everyone. I want to take this time to tell you about our friends over at True Learn. They have this top-of-the-line test bank that is perfect for any upcoming board exams that you may have. They have test banks for all types of exams. So whether you're studying for medical school, nursing school, OT, pharmacy, and others like speech pathology, True Learn is the way to go. If you're like me and going through medical school, they have question banks for all the big exams, like Step 1, Step 2, and Step 3, with quality assessments for each exam. Look. I know we didn't go into healthcare because we love taking tests. This is the hard part of the job. Make it easy on yourself with TrueLearn. Sign up now with the code OFFWHITECOAT to get $25 off your purchase. That's OFF white coat, no spaces, to get $25 off your purchase. This is a test bank that you do not want to pass up on. Make this easy on yourself. Take the deal, pass your boards, and get back to enjoying the reason you went into healthcare. And make sure to use OFFWHITECOAT when you pick it up.